Welcome to Explore, where we are delving into the spectrum of our life in arts, community, and culture. I have two very special guests today that are immersed in the art world. I have Iko Jones and Ken Blackburn. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Iko, how about we start with you? Sure. Who are you? <laughs> Tell us who you are. Uh, I am primarily have been a photographer and filmmaker in Canberra River. Uh, that's been my profession for the last eight years. Okay. And uh, it's always evolving. Now, where did you begin, though? Were you born in Campbell River? N no, I was actually born in Whitehorse in the Yukon Territories. Oh, and then, interesting. Uh, yeah, so I was born there, and then a few months later, my parents decided to move. They weren't Canadian, okay. and they moved to New Zealand, and I, well, via Central America, and ended up growing up in New Zealand until I was about 19. And, and were you on the North Island South or the Island. South Island? Yeah. And South what was your favorite part about the South Island of New Zealand? Uh, the diversity. I mean, the mountains and the ocean are all really close together, and... Uh, yeah, it's just lots to do there. It's similar to here, but I was going to say, sounds yeah. like Vancouver Island. Yeah, the South Island is more similar to here, and the North Island is completely different. Okay. Yeah. Now, when did you find your way back to Vancouver Island, or British Columbia, maybe? Yeah, when I graduated high school, I left, went to Whistler for a couple of years, like lots of Aussies and Kiwis do, <laughs> <laughs> and spent two years there, and then went back to New Zealand after a bit of traveling around, okay. and then a year after that, came back and did an expedition here, which we planned and then ended up staying after that. And I've been here ever since with just trips back to New Zealand. Define expedition. What kayaking. did that look like by then? Uh, kayaking to Alaska. Oh, okay. Yeah, from Vancouver. And that was your first venture? Yep. And how old were you when you did that? 20. And you kayaked all the way to Alaska? Yep. At so 20? It was, yeah, it was like 1,500 miles of paddling for a few months. Wow. With a friend, yeah. That was, what was the most extraordinary part of that experience for you? Uh, funnily enough, I, I, when my friend and I that did it, we were all about the nature and the whales and everything, and ended up the people that we met along the way, the crazy lighthouse keepers, the fishermen, the boaties, that was the, su the surprisingly fun part about it. Okay. Of course, the wilderness and the whales and everything were amazing, but yeah. what surprised us the most was the connections with these really random people we made everywhere. Now, did you, in your experiences that you had with the wildlife, were any of them maybe dangerous? I mean, any encounter with a wild <laughs> animal could be. Right. I wouldn't say any of them were. I mean, we had wolves really close to us. We had bears literally pooping between where we slept. But we never felt threatened. and never felt like we had any risk. We were, tried to be careful and okay. do what we could. Yeah. All right. So that was when you were 20. Yeah. And then what came after that? Uh, living in the Yukon for a couple of months to see what it was like. And when it hit minus 40, I said no. <laughs> <laughs> and went to Vancouver, got dived, uh, trained as a diver for my uh, dive master. I'd already learned to dive in New Zealand when I was 15. And then I did my dive masters in Vancouver so okay. I could start working in diving and with the goal of being an instructor and teaching and sailing. But ended up working here on the island. And that's got me to Vancouver Island. And then I've been here ever since. Okay. So... Where did you evolve from the diving into photography? Where did those two intersect? Um, I originally was, as a diver, I was also a photographer on land when, for my kayak trip. And I mm. played with underwater photography way back just with a little old Nikonis 3 camera for a few rolls of film and then stopped diving altogether for about 13 years. So when I picked up diving again in 2010 for traveling purposes, I uh, thought I got to photograph it as well. So I bought a cheap little you know, waterproof camera in a box and did two really amazing diving trips with that but realized I needed to do it properly with full SLR cameras and a housing and lights like I saw these other guys in the boat have. So I, that was in 2011. So I got my first proper SLR camera after those two trips and started into underwater photography properly at that point and then uh, kind of stopped taking much photos on land at that point and pretty much went to the underwater realm. Now, when you were underwater and you were starting to explore that part as a career, like in actually developing photography underwater yeah. as a means of making a living, what were some of the hurdles that you had to overcome in the early days? Certainly learning a lot of the new technology, like I mean, the, taking a regular SLR camera with 30 buttons on it and then putting it in a housing and trying to figure out what those buttons are and how it all works and the lighting 
was technically a, something to learn, but it wasn't difficult to learn. It just took time learning. Um, and then trying to make, figure out how to make something that was a hobby, taking photos and make it into a career where I can actually get paid doing it. Okay. And that's been the biggest challenge, which has always had its ups and downs. It's very cyclical for a couple of years. I take, get money from one thing and then it dies off. And then I start taking different types of, doing different types of photography, different types of work, you know, and I get paid okay. there for a while. And then I, you know, it's just have to adapt all the time. You can never, just when I think something's perfect, it changes and I have to adapt to some other form, right? So it's okay. always changing. Would you say that um, artists by general um, are very adaptable just by their nature? I would say so, yeah. There's not many rigid artists. <laughs> the people, are create, people that are creative, I guess, any, in any, whether they're artists or, or any creative is generally more flexible, more wing it, go with the flow kind of personalities I find. So. Okay. Certainly, having, being able to adapt to changes is good and see opportunities. At what point did you move from the photography into filmography? Uh, about two years ago. I've, for, since I've started focusing on the salmon in the Campbell River, okay. I was photographing them since 2012 and okay. kind of slowly building a library of photographs. And while I was doing that, I started just doing little video clips to have just a selection of clips. And I knew at some point I wanted to make a film about them. So whenever I was out, I would get little bits of video with different behaviors. And then, so I had a plan to make a film. And then about two years ago, I put a proper emphasis on the filmmaking. I actually did some film schooling with Toronto Film School, started writing okay. synopsises, got funding to, be, to support the film. Oh, great. And was able to then dedicate several months in the river, buying specialized equipment, building equipment, and getting into it. And that sort of happened all over the last two years. Okay. And it's kind of been an evolution out of photography and into the film world. Now, during the 10 years that you were really focusing on photography, how did you see the technology evolve from like 2010 to like 2018 before you moved into the filmography? Yeah, uh, the technology changed quite a bit, but it was in the digital realm at that point. So it's just the digital, the digital technology has gotten better and I only really started getting back into photography digitally when the technology was good enough that it was replicating the old film kind of okay. quality. Um, so that the technology has certainly changed and I mean you have to upgrade your cameras frequently and things like that if you want to keep current in the programs but it didn't change dramatically like it did when it went from film and analog to digital. That was the biggest flip and that was before I got back into it. Okay. Uh, with Filmmaking though that the technology changes happens quicker and there's so many more pieces of equipment and moving parts that you need to make a film and that the, the technology has advanced so far that simple things like mics and crane arms and things have become affordable to the point where an independent filmmaker with not really a budget can right. amass enough filmmaking equipment to actually make something whereas 10 okay. 15 years ago just a simple follow focus mechanism might be 15 20 thousand dollars. Okay. Now you can buy stuff for a few hundred dollars and makes it affordable to get into it. Right. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, um, you're watching Explore coming to you from the Tidemark Theatre here in Campbell River. My two guests today are Ico Jones and Ken Blackburn. We will be right back. Stay right where you are. Welcome back to Explore. We are coming to you from the Tidemark Theatre. We are exploring and delving into the spectrum of our life, arts, community, and culture. My guests today are Iko Jones, a filmmaker, and Ken Blackburn. Too many titles to mention. <laughs> let's start with your titles. Ken, what tell titles? us. Let's start, let's start with your museum title. What do you do at the museum? Uh, I'm the public program manager the at public the museum, program so I'm okay. responsible for all the public programming that the museum puts on. And then I'm also the executive director of the Campbell River Arts Council. All right. And uh, my background's actually in fine art, though. I, I have a master's degree in sculpture, so I kind of start with artist and work after <laughs> that. <laughs> Now, we were talking about um, how technology has changed over the last 10 years. 
for ICO with the photography and into the filmography. And I'm quite sure that over the last 50 years, which is what the Arts Council is now celebrating, they're celebrating their 50th year. How have you seen the technology around art evolve in that time period? Not that you're <laughs> old enough to remember the beginning of that. 50 but. years, yeah. Well, the Arts Council was formed around the time of the moon landing, so <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's been a lot of shifts, you know. Yeah. But the art world, you know, you can, you can trace it through kind of art uh, mediums and subject matters. You know, the 60s was kind of the end of modernism where you would you would you know, kind of see the rise of conceptual art, the rise of land arts, uh, certainly the rise of abstractions uh, that would drift into the 70s and head towards what would be called you know, sort of postmodernism and yeah. the rediscovery of identities and political identities and uh, identity politics that would you know, run through into the 90s where you, know, you have the rise of, of feminism and you know, queer cultures. And, that would all start to have voices that would be contributing. And then as you, as you approach the end of the 90s and into the 2000s, it's technology that really comes into the forefront with the, with the rise of, of just how a filmmaking changed to be, to be something that everybody could be a producer with. Uh, and then of course into social medias uh, and just the explosion of uh, sort of communication theory and uh, data and the implications of data on, that reflects back on art making that really we're in that kind of phase now. So it's uh, an incredible trajectory and probably, you know, a Bible sized coffee table book to try to describe mm -hmm. 50 years of, of the progression of art from, you know, mm -hmm. the Arts Council being formed in 1970. I guess the moon landing was 69, but yeah. yeah. Um, and just, I mean, I just look at the change in television, even, right. you know, during that time period. So, and the rise of computers. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a long time. Now, it's funny, Iko, that you mentioned that you went back to photography when the digital technology caught up to itself mm -hmm. and was able to um, replicate what the older cameras could do on yeah. film print. And I remember having a conversation um, in the last year or so with Beth Boyce, who is the curator at the museum, around the devastating effect that digital technology is having on archives because the archives are going to be empty for the last 10 years because they're not saving anything in hard copy. I mean, I think the museum is, but in general, mm. um, it used to be that you printed everything and saved that as archival material. But now you've got everything saved digitally, but they're not taking a digital snapshot and saving it as a print and using that. Like, w have you given any of that any thought? Either one of you, I'll open that up. Yeah, I mean, it's it, the data storage because of digital, you know, you, when you had a camera that had 24, 36 rolls of film, or if you're doing medium format or anything that just had individual, you would shoot way less. With digital, whether it's photography or film, you can shoot hundreds of thousands of pictures. You can, sh you can just leave a camera rolling and record all this data. You need huge amounts of data storage, but you take so many pictures or video that to make a physical copy of a lot of it, you know, you'd be daunting. Uh, nice. So that makes it more difficult. I mean, certainly some people say you should uh, print everything off, but unless you're getting high quality prints done, that's gonna change the digital, keeps a more accurate uh, rendition of that file. Right. But it's, it's uh, got liabilities around storing digital media, right? Right. So. And Ken, what about yeah, you I, in the uh, print world? In, in terms of uh, archiving and sort of museum collections uh, and community memory, I mean, digitization is fantastic. It, it, it has the ability to capture so many of the nuances of, of what community interactions are. Um, and it, pr it provides really rapid uh, search engines for researchers to be able to, to find a lot of material that, you know, the old uh, paper and box kind of approach yes. to archiving was really laborious. Um, and also for researchers, they can research from your house now rather than travel to institutions mm -hmm. around the world. Right. You know, because travel costs were one of the probably the biggest um, impediments to a lot of research that has gone on in the past, but now it's instantly available through online databases. So um, 
Yeah, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't think it's catastrophe in any way. I mm -hmm. think it's really increased the ability to understand the complexities of the world, which are <laughs> getting more complex all the time. Yes. But it, pro it, it provides access to uh, the minutia of, of what really makes communities tick. So, yeah, you know, um, for in, in the art world, uh, you know, it gives the opportunity for a lot of just diverse mediums now rising too. But right. it, you know, it doesn't replace the traditional painting or sculpture or printmaking. Uh, those things, I think, uh, have actually come back in a very strong way. Mm -hmm. um, all you have to do is look at First Nations culture and carving. Yes. You know, nothing replaces the mask. So th there will always be a role for the solid objects of things. Right. Digitization just expands their potential, I think. Okay. What would you say the role of art is within a community? We could do a whole episode <laughs> on this, Mary Ruth. <laughs> the, the arts are an amazing, resourceful, creative tool for any sector, whether you're talking about economic development or social development or cultural development, environmental development. All of those... Um, challenges in communities or issues are very complex and they require the ability of all sectors to contribute to how to understand them and the arts are probably the strongest facilitator of cross-pollinization between sectors to be able to approach creatively whatever the challenge is whether it's economic challenges or social homelessness um, cultural considerations you know now with decolonization um, and with uh, black lives matter with all the social unrest it's the arts that have the ability to get to the root of storytelling right. and it's in the root of storytelling that you provided clues as to where a the challenges or problems may lie and then B and C where the solutions can be through really positive communication and strong communication. And this is what the arts do. They foster strong communication and they force us to think creatively. Right. And that's what we really need in these days is creative solutions um, because a lot of the, the roots of the challenges are in very historic injustices that have tended to be looked at from only one particular lens. And we need to start looking at them through multiple lenses, and the arts offer us those lenses. So, okay. uh, I, if I could butt in there for a second too, that sure. I think from arts in motion too, arts create emotion, whether right. it's music, imagery, whatever. And when you can have somebody emotionally connect to a subject, or something that's happening politically or whatever, that emotional connection causes change more than intellectual alone. So I think right. the arts have that connection to to the emotional. Yeah, okay. absolutely. That's very true. Awesome. All right, we're going to take a short break. Uh, you are watching Explore, coming to you from the Tidemark Theatre. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Explore. We are coming to you from the Tidemark Theatre. My guests are Ken Blackburn, the Executive Director of the Campbell River Arts Council, and Ico Jones, photographer and filmmaker. Now, before the break, we were talking about the importance of community and art and how they intersect. Now, in the break, Ico, you had a very interesting observation about conservation and art and how which comes first. Mm. I don't know that any one comes first particularly, but the route that I've chosen is to create art of animals, of environments, of landscapes that I'm passionate about, that I'm involved with, and especially underwater where the average person doesn't get to, create art and have that create an emotional response or an, or an intellectual response with people, but just show a world that is done differently than just a picture, it's art as well. And then when people buy that and put it as a print on a wall or they watch a video or whatever, creates an emotional response which then creates a change for that person. It might only be tiny, but it creates a change, and then that leads to questions. Right. Um, versus saying, saying something about the subject and then showing some pictures to back it up. Mm -hmm. I'm using the, the art form first to create 
the emotional response. Okay. And Ken, the Art and Earth Festival, that's coming up in a couple of weeks, but what was the premise of even beginning having a festival called Art and Earth? Where did that come from? Uh, well, actually, it relates a lot to what Eichel just said uh, in the, the importance of an emotive response um, to, to any subject matter that you're, you're looking at. The environment uh, has to be, first and foremost, one of our biggest challenges that we're facing as a planet. Now, the pandemic has, has kind of shifted the, the conversation a little bit, but the environment's not going away. And it, it is something that needs to have uh, creative approaches across all sectors to be able to understand the complexity of what the problem is. It's difficult to do that continually on an intellectual basis um, or on a data-driven basis or science basis because people start to tune it out. And I think that there is environmental fatigue that's been happening um, you know, in the discourse, especially in media, about environmental challenges. Mm -hmm. So the thinking was Campbell River is perfectly positioned to approach the environment some, from so many directions. And, you know, Ico's work is a good example of that, of underwater, uh, you know, rivers and the, the health of rivers and the importance to, to overall environmental concerns. So how could we create a festival that would look at the, the complexity of the environment, but be starting from an emotive level rather than just sort of problem identification, which we tend to get a lot of in the media. And okay. this is where the arts are powerful. Environmental right. artists are working to try to enhance our, not just our understanding of the environment, but our appreciation for it. Because it's well known that if people appreciate something and understand it, they tend to want to protect it more deeply. So the idea of the festival was to bring the arts in partnership with the environment, Greenways Land Trust, in partnership with culture and history with the museum mm -hmm. and with the Arts Council, with the Tidemark, with the gallery, to have a, a kind of broad conversation uh, about how can we raise not just our understanding, but our appreciation and our amazement at, at just how complex, but in, how incredibly amazing you know, Campbell River is, but I mean, how amazing our, this planet is. So how could we do it differently? And that's what drove the idea to try to create a new festival to celebrate that. And one of the other gems in Campbell River, of course, is the Hague Brown House, which the Campbell River Museum oversees. So, and of course they were naturalists, world renowned, and that dovetails perfectly with the messaging that you're talking about. Absolutely, yeah, because we have, uh, I mean, I've managed the Hague Brown Festival for 15 years now, and it was very much about the legacy of Roderick and Anne Hague Brown, not just environmental, but also social justice issues uh, with Anne and her work with the Transition House and women. Um, and folding that into the need for having a yearly touchstone, not just the festival, but the need to create a lecture and to have what is kind of the advanced writing um, and or filmmaking as, as we've also done over the years in environmental thinking. Okay. And why couldn't we create out in Campbell River a yearly lecture that would address uh, you know, leading issues within the environmental world and establish that lecture as a, as a real West Coast kind of statement to the world. So we, Eichel will be our lecturer this year and it will be our 11th annual Hague Brown lecture. So with the combination of Art and Earth and Hague Brown Festival kind of merging mm -hmm. the use of Sybil Andrews Cottage and the Hague Brown property as heritage properties in town, and then with the, the rise of the lecture kind of combining, we're getting a very strong uh, set of, of uh, concepts or, or, or set of um, events that we've clustered together to talk about the environment through the arts. So. Okay. So this year's Arts and Earth Festival, um, give us the lowdown on how that's going to unfold in this world of COVID. Well, very good question, Mary Ruth. Yeah, obviously a big shift. You know, one of the key things for people to understand about the environment is first-hand experiences. Get out into nature, which Greenways Land Trust, you know, traditionally does a lot of walks. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so we had to we had to just cut back. We have gone online for most of it. You know, uh, Eichel's uh, lecture, the Hague Brown lecture, will be live streamed from this stage at the Tide Mark. The Stewardship Awards will be live streamed from this stage in the Tide Mark, and then we will be releasing. Um, short kind of uh, videos produced by Greenways Land Trust, produced by the museum, produced by the Arts Council that will be over that weekend of the 25th, 26th, 27th, as well as the art gallery kind of kicking us off with the opening of, of their uh, exhibit uh, on the 24th. So it's a challenge, but we need to keep the conversation going. We can't just say, okay, we're going to take a year off because we don't, we don't have... It, we can't afford to do that. So we'll right. just find a new way to talk about it. Okay. It sounds really fascinating. And I love that you're going to be utilizing the Tidemark stage. And so your film, when you are giving your lecture, you're also going to show your film. Yes, I'm going to okay. do a like 20 minute sweet talk first about uh, my work as a salmon photographer, filmmaker, um, what that's entailed and some of the challenges. And then talk about the film specifically, why I made it and then uh, yeah, show it on the screen for the people in the audience and it'll be live streamed as well and that's a 40 minute film. And that film is just about the salmon, it's their story, their journey in life, completely separate from anything we've done as humans. So it's just 100% salmon. Awesome. Yeah. Well that is, sounds absolutely fantastic and I'm really excited to see how this unfolds in this new world of COVID. But it mm -hmm. sounds like you've got all of the avenues covered, which is great news. And you did mention audience, but we are keeping an eye on what uh, Dr. Bonnie mm -hmm. Henry has to say between now and next Sunday. Uh, but it will be available streaming live online and you can watch for the posting on Facebook and all social media as to how to be a part of the streaming. Now it's gonna stream live on what, is it the Hague Brown website or is it the museum website? It will be through the Tidemark. Through the Tidemark theater, website? Through their okay. website, yes. Okay. And just to make, just you know, we're really hoping people will come out and support a digital ticket. I know that this is, this is the way forward for theaters and for a lot of the arts yes. uh, is, is digital experience. We're really hoping people will come and support the new platform. And just as a, to let people know, the film, Eiko's film will not be available online after the lecture. It is a kind of your chance to see it um, because it will be held back uh, okay. on, for a release at a future date, hopefully right. when we can have more bodies. But Okay, so. excellent. Well, Ken and Eiko, thank you so much for joining me today. No I've really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. You've really shed a light on arts and community for sure. Thanks for having so, me. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for watching Explore, coming to you from the Tidemark Theatre. We will see you again.